Kwaba. Welcome back. If you are just joining us, African aesthetics is our topic discussing the essential question of what is beautiful? It is a question we grapple with, fighting against the bombardment of images and imagery that does not affirm our unique beauty, even as cultural bandits appropriate that same beauty for themselves. A century ago, it was indeed revolutionary to believe that black people had a unique culture that was beautiful and worthy of preservation. But that was exactly the assessment of one Zora Neale Hurston. Born 1891, Zora was an anthropologist, folklorist, and best-selling Harlem Renaissance novelist. She studied and documented the ways and folkways of Southern Black people expressed through the oral tradition in our own dialect, highlighted in folk tales, sermons, and family histories. Without her deeply held belief that our ways of being were beautiful and worthy of preservation, we would have lost a rich historical aspect of ourselves. That is why our writings, our voices, and our perspectives are so important. We must affirm ourselves for our children's sake. As an anthropologist studying the folkways of Southern Black people, Zora Neale Hurston wrote, and I quote, the will to adorn is the second most notable characteristic in Negro expression. Perhaps his ideas of adornment does not attempt to meet the conventional standards, but it satisfies the soul of the creator. Her observation speaks to the inherent substance of an ancient African sensibility and aesthetic that can be witnessed even in our contemporary times. The examples abound from tattoos to body piercing to elaborate haircuts and hairstyles. Who else can turn a baseball cap backwards and start a major fashion trend? Of course, not everyone sees or appreciates the beauty of the black aesthetics, but it is indeed satisfying to us, the creators. Deliberate historical efforts in this regard were aggressively advanced by Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, Pan-Africanist, preeminent scholar, institution builder, writer, activist, and one of the founders of the Harlem Renaissance. In 1926, Du Bois developed the criteria of Negro art as a formal philosophy and criteria for art worthy of dissemination as part of the Harlem Renaissance movement. According to Du Bois, whether the artistic modality utilized poetry, the novel, short story, visual arts, playwriting, or music, the cultural product had to reflect the highest aspirations of the race. It needed to be self-conscious, uplifting imagery and intelligent expression. It had to be imbued with beauty, lyrical grace, and speak to the mind, soul, and heart. This art needed to inspire the black populace and simultaneously prove to white society the humanity and worthiness of people of African descent. As a message strategically crafted and purposefully imparted to transform the very reality of black existence, the cultural art of Du Bois's Renaissance had to take the people's suffering and write it with nobility and portray the motherland with unspoiled beauty and glory. Finally, Du Bois envisioned the cultural arts as a motivator for African-Americans to not only reach for excellence in their pursuits, but to cast off any degrading behavioral tendencies imposed by racial degradation and oppression. In his essay, The Criteria for Negro Art, 
Du Bois makes no apologies for forcefully stating his view, philosophy, and criterion. He wrote, and I quote, all art is propaganda and ever must be, despite the wailing of the purists. I stand in utter shamelessness and say that whatever art I have for writing has been used always for propaganda, for gaining the right of black folk to love and enjoy. I do not care a damn for any art that is not used for propaganda, but I do care when propaganda is confined to one side while the other is stripped and silent." End quote. Du Bois's use of the word propaganda harkens back to its original meaning, sharing ideas that would forward a cause. In this case, the cause of uplifting a race of people who have been systematically disparaged and vilified. Du Bois also writes of the still prevailing subconscious poison coursing through the veins of too many black people that, and I quote, the white man's ice is colder. In this reiteration of self-hatred, the works of our hands isn't good enough unless white people say it is good and their work is always better. Unenlightened black people desire and seek white approval. Consequently, if whites critique, critique their work as worthless, agreement is resentfully accepted. Du Bois forcefully urges black people to no longer submit to the gaze of a white judge and jury, writing, quote, we must come to the place where the work of art, when it appears, is reviewed and acclaimed by our own free, unfettered judgment, end quote. In other words, not being unduly influenced by the white gaze. The poet Langston Hughes also weighed in on this idea, especially as it concerned darker skinned black people. He spoke for a group of ebony artists when he said he and his colleagues want to express their individual dark skinned selves without fear or shame. If white people are pleased, we are glad. If colored people are pleased, we are glad. If they are not, their displeasure doesn't matter either. Certainly, when so-called respectable members of the larger society observe what is sometimes referred to as street fashion, urban styles, and other ghetto fabulous expressions with disdain, for many of today's young people, to quote both Du Bois and Hughes, they don't care a damn because their displeasure doesn't matter. Nevertheless, in real time, the pressure to mimic white standards of beauty is embedded into life in the West. For black women, the question of what is beautiful was and unfortunately still is a vexing issue adorned with thorns. From the various shades of our skin, the shapes of our bodies, to the hair on our heads, women of the African diaspora in particular have been made to endure a hierarchical beauty standard that does not include us. The imposition of a European woman as the pinnacle of beauty, a woman who is thin, stick-like, blonde, Blue-eyed with narrow features and pale white skin has been promoted in magazines, movies, television programs, advertising, you name it. Conversely, this message has planted many a seed of self-image loathing. Our reactions include skin bleaching, frying our hair straight, not to mention impossibly long weaves. Tragically, the trend is global, even in the motherland, so much so that the National Museum of Black Civilizations in Dakar, Senegal, a museum exhibit was devoted to the subject. The installation featured 
dozens of skin lightening products commonly used in various countries on the continent and advertised as beautifying skin tone evening and provides clear skin. One product in particular gets to the heart of this egregious trend. It's called, wait for it, Perfect White and is widely available and advertised. <sighs> In a world that has denigrated everything and anything black or African, the idea of African art as a subject worthy of study was a hard sell at best. Yet, Yale University professor Robert Ferris Thompson specialized in African art history and concluded that African civilizations were and are tremendously varied, even as they are connected in their ethical, philosophical, and aesthetic systems. Intensely interested in all aspects of the African aesthetic, Thompson devoted his 50-year academic career to enthusiastically studying African art, often leaving the ivory tower to personally investigate African art traditions, especially the Yoruba of Nigeria. Using his cachet as a white American academician, Thompson elevated the study of African art and aesthetics beyond the narrow ethnographic box the subject had been relegated to. In fully grasping the complexity and sophistication of the African aesthetic, he combined art history, anthropology, dance history, religious studies, sociology, and ethnomusicology. His work demonstrated African aesthetic complexity, connectedness, and a sophisticated genius often denied. His book, Flash of the Spirit, African and Afro-American Art and Philosophy has been widely read by scholars, students of both art history and black studies, and has touched areas of philosophy and religious studies. In terms of influence in the art world, African aesthetic sensibilities deeply inspired a number of famous artists, including Pablo Picasso and Henry Matisse. Both of these European artists absorbed the beauty of African artifacts that were stolen and placed in European museums. The idea of stolen African artifacts displayed in European art institutions is a thorny reality that is currently being fiercely debated as the demand for repatriation of priceless cultural art as well as restitution has become a constant call from a number of African countries. Needless to say, there is something bordering on schizophrenic in saying that African aesthetic and artistic creativity is inherently inferior while simultaneously stealing and feeling your prestigious museums with all manner of beautiful African creations. As things are slowly changing and countries are insisting that their cultural treasures be returned, various art institutions are moving progressively in that direction. Lonnie Bunch, founding director of the National African American Museum of History and Culture in Washington, D.C., and now the first African American director of the 21 Smithsonian Museums has initiated a broad review of artifacts acquired through looting a country's cultural treasures, particularly countries in Africa. Looting, a euphemism for theft, was a common practice during the colonial era. There are a multitude of examples, including priceless treasures from ancient Egypt, or Kemet that are housed in museums in the Louvre in Paris, the Egyptology Museum at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, as well as enormous number of cultural artifacts held by the British Museum in London. The theft of 10 
thousand Benin artifacts stolen in 1897 are held by at least 160 museums, including 45 in the US, 43 in the UK, and 24 in Germany, according to an article in The Grio, an internet newspaper with a focus on all issues black. Director Bunch has decided to provide global leadership on this issue and is preparing to return 39 Benin bronzes stolen from Nigeria during the sacking raid of 1897. France is returning 26 Benin treasures and Belgium and the Netherlands have recently agreed to return artwork stolen during the colonial era. Germany has also decided to return stolen artifacts, in this case, jewelry, to the people of Namibia. The return of these priceless aesthetic works by the Berlin Ethnological Museum reflects a purposeful effort to right wrongs when Namibia was a German colony and was subjected to genocidal atrocities committed against the people to subdue them from resisting occupation. A museum spokesperson noted that while the jewelry collection was a reflection of the creativity and ingenuity of the Namibian people, it was acquired through the process of appropriation and often violently. But I digress. For Picasso, African masks were a particular fascination. Beginning in 1906 to 1909, he began to create vibrant paintings where African masks and comedic artifacts were distinct influences. The artistic power of traditional African sculpture remained an inspiration for Picasso for many years after his specific African period of creativity. We'll be right back. 